Hello and welcome to Bloomberg Quint. You're watching the fine print. Air Asia Malaysia and Tata Sun's owned Air Asia India is facing fresh turbulence. The Central Bureau of Investigation or CBI has booked Air Asia Malaysia and India Group CEO Tony Fernandez, Ramachandran Venkatramanan, Director Air Asia, who is also a trustee of Tata Trusts, and five others for criminal conspiracy. Tata Sons and Air Asia Malaysia own 49% each in Air Asia India. Venkatramanan owns 1.5%, and S. Ramadaroy, former chief executive officer of Tata Consultancy Services, holds 0.5%. In the FIR, CBI has made out two grounds. One, Air Asia Group and its management violate the FIPB and FDI norms by giving effective management and control to Air Asia Malaysia. As per the FDI and air operating permit rules, foreigners cannot own or control an Indian airline. This, the CBI says, was achieved through a brand license agreement. This agreement made Air Asia India a subsidiary of the Malaysian entity and not a joint venture. Two, Air Asia India and Malaysia's officials bribed public servants including those at the Ministry of Civil Aviation, to amend the 520 rule. This rule mandated five years of domestic flying and 20 aircraft fleet before permission could be given to launch international operations. The 520 rule was scrapped by the current government in 2016. CBI has stated that both these grounds amount to criminal conspiracy under the Indian Penal Code and criminal misconduct by public servants under the Prevention of Corruption Act. How will this case progress from here and is it likely likely to meet the fate the 2G case did. To answer that, I have with me Senior Advocate KTS Tulsi. Mr. Tulsi, thank you for joining us here on The Fine Print. Mr. Tulsi, for the benefit of our viewers, I'm going to ask you a process question first. This is just an FIR. What sort of an inquiry does the CBI conduct before an FIR is filed and what happens after this? Well, normally a preliminary inquiry is required to be conducted into matters like this. I don't know whether the preliminary inquiry has been conducted or not conducted. It, it doesn't mention that a preliminary inquiry has been conducted. But it may have been conducted, one can't say, from the reading of the FIR. I have read just the FIR, which is available in public domain. I, do, I have no other source of knowledge. But I, I would say that preliminary inquiry is conducted to see as to whether the ingredients of any cognizable criminal offence are made up. If, if, even if you agree, assume all the allegations to be correct. I don't think the offence is made out, and therefore the FIR, in my opinion, would be an abuse of the process of criminal law. Sir, let me it come to sure. Sir, let me come to now the specific grounds based on which the CBI has filed this FIR. The first ground that CBI has stated uh, has to do with the terms of the brand license agreement. Now, this is not a new issue. Back in 2014, Subramaniam Swami had first filed a petition on this before the Delhi High Court, and the court had directed the DGCA to examine this very agreement. Uh, the DGCA had looked at the terms related to business operations, operating requirements, etc., to conclude that the substantial Financial ownership and control rests with Indian nationals. How do you see? Uh, how do you think the court at uh, the trial stage uh, is going to view this allegation in the light of this DGC order? Yes, because I, I believe. Let us assume that the 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 DGCA norms have been violated in 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 the matter of control. The majority control should be with the Indian party. If it has been violated, it may be a ground for cancelling the uh, agreement or the license or the permit. It can't be a criminal offence under the Prevention of Corruption Act. You see, if, if, if the conditions of license are breached, it is a ground for administrative action. But it, it can't be said that there are unknown public servants, and therefore there is an offence under the Prevention of Corruption Act. You register an offence under Section 13.1D. 13.1D has to have demand, acceptance. Those are the ingredients of the offence. Acceptance of illegal pecuniary advantage. Who, who is alleged to have received any pecuniary advantage? The, the FIR is completely silent. After all, the FIR must have the ingredients of the offence for being valid. That is in the law from Swapandas Gupta. 
Justice uh, Chandrachur's judgment, Chandrachur Senior. The law is very clear, but I don't understand as to why this government comes out with lame prosecution. Okay, so you're saying, sir, that the FIR should have those details as to which sub public servant asked for a bribe or which public servant received the bribe. That sort of information should have been mentioned in the FIR? Yes, um, in a, uh, an FIR which accuses of the offence of 13.1D, this is only one offence which, uh, which is said to have been committed, 13.1D, and it says unknown public servant. So it's roving and fishing inquiry. That's not the purpose of an FIR. Investigation must disclose offence. And then the investigation goes on to find out as to who are guilty of that offence. But here the offence itself is not, not disclosed. You assume the allegation. One lobbyist has paid another lobbyist. What, what, what is it? How, how is it a criminal offence under the Prevention of Corruption Act? 13.1D? Okay. So, sir, yes. the second allegation, like you've also alluded to, relates to lobbying. They have said that Venkat Ramanan had lobbied to get all the government approvals, including the FIPB clearance and a change in the 520 rule. And they've also named several other entities, such as Rajendra Dubey, Sunil Kapoor, Deepak Talwar. Uh, they've said that all these uh, people acted as agents to bribe government officials. How are you reading this allegation? You see... They have to show demand of bribe and then acceptance of that bribe. Offer and acceptance, demand, offer and acceptance. Here, nothing is there. One lobbyist is being paid. One lobbyist engaged in a second lobbyist, second lobbyist engaged, third lobbyist. Lobbying is not a crime under any law. Unless money is paid, the offense is not committed. The money is not even... They don't even know which public servant they received. So the chosen to the not name them in the... Lobby. Could they have not just chosen to not name them in the FIR, sir? They say unknown. Unknown. On the date of the offence, they are not known. If they are not known, you don't register in FIR. You wait for the names to be available. Only then you can register in FIR. This is exactly what is an abuse or the process of, K, of criminal law. FIR must disclose the offence. You see, it's a serious thing, subjecting a citizen to investigation. And investigation comes in public domain then. And when investigation can only take place if all these allegations are assumed to be correct, at least they should lead to conviction. But there is no allegation of 13.1D, no fact which would satisfy the ingredient of 13.1D, and that's the only offence that is alleged in the entire FIR. Sure. Okay, so the, the entire FIR and the kind of allegations that the CBI has made reminded me somewhat of the outcome in the 2G case. There too, there were allegations against the government officials of getting bribed to get a favourable policy outcome. But the court in that case had dismissed all allegations of corruption for lack of admissible evidence. In this case, if CBI were to use the 2G case as a learning, what kind of evidence they will need to prove that the change in 520 rule was an abuse of power and not an ex exercise of power by the executive you see they have to prove illegal illegally obtained pecuniary advantage by a public servant by saying unknown public servant you don't acquire jurisdiction police does not have the power the right to defame people without having hard evidence legally admissible evidence there is no evidence they are saying conspiracy conspiracy to do what conspiracy to appoint lobbyists who will expedite the proceedings with the government. That's not uh, an offence under any law. Criminal, pro criminal conspiracy can only be with regard to an illegal act or a legal act done in an illegal manner. How does this conspiracy 120 be? It does not refer to any fact which can satisfy the ingredients of the offence of conspiracy. And 13.1D is actually obtaining pecuniary advantage. There is no such thing in the entire FIR that they are at least suspecting that there was an FIR, that there is any anybody who has been offered, anybody who has accepted. Nothing of the sort. But they have said and that. The cabinet is, but they have said that they, the government officials, uh, uh, at, even at the ministry level, were bribed.
No, they are saying bribes, but they say unknown public servants. Which government servant? This is a preliminary inquiry is exactly meant for this. You are supposed to find out the ingredient is for Prevention of Corruption Act can apply to anybody only if there is a public servant. If there is no public servant, how, how do you accuse them of entering into a conspiracy to pay when nobody has been offered, nobody has been, nobody has demanded, nobody has accepted? That evidence was not there. How do they register an FIR only because uh, they, they, they want to defame people? Well, we will have to wait for the court to hear the case to see if, in fact, the CBI can prove any of these allegations. Mr. Tulsi, thank you for joining us with the views on the fine print. Moving on. Bakrangi, Manpasan Beverages and Atlanta all have something in common, a tanking stock price and unhappy auditors. The statutory auditors of all three companies quit on grounds that they have not been given adequate information to audit the financials of the company. The companies have disagreed with their auditors and defended themselves, saying they had provided adequate information. So, in this he says, she says fight between the companies and their auditors, who should shareholders believe? The fine print when looking for some answers. On April 27, Price Waterhouse and Co. resigned as auditor of Vakrangi within eight months of being appointed. On May 26, Deloitte Haskinson Sells resigned as auditor of Manpasan Beverages after having audited the company since it went public. And just this week, Atlanta's one year old auditor, Price Waterhouse and Co. resigned as its auditor. Well, I think there certainly it seems to be a problem with the accounts of the companies. Of the course. fact that uh, in the course of the audit, see what happens is when you're nearing the finalization of the audit, you need to take a call as to whether you have received all the information which you require for the purpose of the audit. If you've not received the information, the question then is, is that information the, which you have, is missing, is it material? Is it material and pervasive? So therefore, would there be a disclaimer of opinion? Would there be a qualification? One would then discuss that with the management, see if the management can address that. And it's only then if there, there is no agreement that the manager sticks to its guns and says that, no, we can't provide you this information. But if the auditor feels that it's extremely relevant, that the auditor would normally take the extreme step of resigning from that company. In Vakrangi's case, PwC said it asked the management for information on several matters pertaining to election books, bullion and jewellery businesses. But the management's responses were inadequate or contradicted earlier explanations. In its response, Vakrangi made no mention of information on election books, bullion or jewellery businesses, but maintained that it had provided all the information with respect to the businesses and affairs of the company to the auditor and the audit committee, and that is fully compliant with Indian accounting standards. Manpasan Beverages failed to provide significant information, says Deloitte, but doesn't elaborate on what this information was. The company's response is equally generic and contradictory. Manpasan Beverages says that parting with the auditor was the company's decision and called it a minor hiccup that won't have a long-term impact. In Atlanta's case, PwC says the company had failed to provide it with significant observations made by tax authorities and even when the information was provided, it was delayed. And this delay hindered the impact assessment of tax authorities' observation on the financial statements. But the company has contested this detailing that PwC was well informed about the outstanding tax demand for the last six years and its request to conduct an independent investigation of the tax cases was acceded to. And that its resignation came as a surprise to the company. With both sides defending their stance, where does this he says, she says battle leave the shareholders? Well, I will only like to say that uh, shareholders are bound to be perturbed as to what is happening in the companies. So far as uh, Vakrangi is concerned, I am not too bothered because uh, PwC were appointed only during the year and uh, they did only two of the quarter's reviews. And probably they realized uh, at just before the end of the year that the kind of information that they should have been getting, they have not been able to get and that they prefer to resign rather than doing anything else. But so far as uh, Deloitte is concerned, I am li little surprised because of the fact that uh, they have been auditing this company for several years and I think the management and the auditors must have been enjoying some kind of a repo so far as uh, the provision, providing of the information is concerned. And uh, if you look at the last year's reports itself, there have been unqualified opinions even with regard to internal financial control reporting. So suddenly what has happened, it's very difficult to say, but definitely something uh, 
happened which spurred uh, them to resign and that seems to be very very disturbing in fact and uh, shareholders should really be disturbed as to what has happened in the company while the responses by the three companies lack details the explanations by the auditors are no better according to the companies act 2013 if an auditor resigns it has to file a statement with the company and the registrar of companies with the reasons and other facts as may be relevant with regard to his resignation The auditors in these cases have failed to state as to how material the missing information is for financial earnings. So, are auditors choosing client confidentiality over shareholders' interest? So far as the auditors are concerned, even under the Companies Act today, they are supposed to explain as to why they are resigning, and I think we are duty bound to tell the public why we are resigning. Merely a one-liner is not good enough. I, I think, so far as the letter of PwC is concerned, it is still a little bit elaborate. but so far as the lawyer are concerned i i think the letter does give out specific uh, reasons except for saying yes they have not been able to get the information and i think if the information can uh, really be prejudicial to the public interest uh, which they are not providing i i think it is not good ethically if you really ask me even otherwise to, even to the incoming auditor if you are able to provide the reasons today in the public domain I think it will be good for the incoming auditor also to establish whether he should be accepting the appointment or not. By not giving the reasons uh, clearly, explicitly, I I, I think uh, we are trying to hide more than what we are trying to reveal, and that's no good. I think the information should have been given, frankly speaking, as to which are the areas, and what is the they felt what what was the materiality of the uh, that these were material areas, and therefore this was the reason that should have been stated. but unfortunately you know, i think they at least in the deloitte case they've left it very vague and that is where i think a little bit more detail should have been given because one you know see what happens is that when does this resignation happen when the information is not available so the question then is you're just saying that the information in this area is not available what is the extent to which there is a problem you cannot gauge until you have that information and that's where i think uh, the problem, the quandary arose for the auditors it's not just the outgoing auditors who are in a quandary incoming auditors will have to face their set of issues too as per the code of conduct laid down by the institute of chartered accountants of india the incoming auditor must seek a no objection letter from the outgoing auditor both bakrangi and manpasan have already appointed new auditors ap sanskiri and co and mehra goel and co so will the new auditors be able to do any better now here if the auditors i i presume the the auditors have done their own risk assessment and they feel that probably either they would be able to qualify the report or they will be able to give a disclaimer or they will be able to give an adverse report i don't think that there can be a clean report under these circumstances under any way in in any way so if the auditor feels that he will still be able to comply with the standards on auditing which probably the big four firms thought no they they don't want to take any further risks i i think the new the incoming auditor Uh, has accepted the assignment so let's move on and let's see what happens but i am very sure that any of the three conditions is going to happen in the reporting either it will be an extensively qualified report or it will be a disclaimer it will be an adverse report it cannot be a clean report under any circumstances there could be one more aspect to it also you know the company because of this adverse public pressure may decide that okay it's in our interest to disclose the information take a qualification or take a disclaimer you know that's what could happen because of the public pressure i think that's also likely to happen that the information which they were not willing to provide to the earlier auditors because of public pressure they may decide to give that information to the incoming auditor well even in the off chance that these companies agree to provide the information to the incoming auditors it would come at a huge cost on the day their auditors quit the share price of these companies nose dived anywhere between 5 to 20% that's all there is on this week's show do send us your feedback thanks so much for watching we'll see you next week